There we go. So let me explain up front. Eamon is just the Gaelic word for Edward. And to my family, I am known as Eamon. And uh, when I came to America many years ago, I would say to people, don't say amen, say amen, because that's how it's pronounced. But that got a bit tiresome after a while, so I just went with it. But when I started working in the history area again, after I retired, people started calling me Eamon. So th th that, that's what that's about. So uh, I, I came across this accidentally. My my area of interest is, is Irish miners, and I was... Uh, actually investigating a man called by the name of Patrick Queeley, who, who was an Irish immigrant who made it big in, in coal mining in Wyoming. <clears throat> and I, I came across some stuff about Rock Springs that I thought was of interest. Um, most people know about Rock Springs, but basically in, in 1885, uh, parties of very angry white and British miners attacked the Chinatown at Rock Springs. Uh, shooting, it was a mob action, setting fires and expelling the Chinese. Uh, 28 Chinese died um, and uh, they all fled the town, the Chinatown emptied out, they ran out into the, the brush and most of them eventually made their way west about uh, 80 miles to Evanston where there was a larger Chinatown. And, and this Rock Springs mob action is usually considered the worst uh, instance of ethnic violence in the mining West. The story actually starts an awful lot earlier. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad was, was completed to promontory Utah territory in 1869, primarily by Irish labor, uh, where it was met by the Central Pacific, which primarily utilized much lower cost Chinese labor. Um, the Union Pacific had found coal all along its tracks in Southwest Wyoming. And uh, mining started in the 1860s uh, with primarily British contract miners. They were Lankies or Lank people from Lancashire and Welsh miners. Uh, they were paid seven cents a bushel or about 200 to buck 50 a ton uh, to mine it. And an experienced miner did about two tons a day. So $5 a day in 1868-69 wasn't bad money. But then uh, two, two things happened. Well, for, first of all, th there was a massive recession in the early 1870s with the return of, of the greenback, the US dollar to the gold standard. Um, and, and secondly, the, the Union Pacific itself, which for much of its life was engulfed in all kinds of financial scandals during the building and, and during its managing. And it fell into the hands of a, a very unscrupulous gentleman by the name of Jay Gould. Um, the, the, the recession of, of the 1870s was one of the worst. Uh, the price of wheat dropped by a factor of four in, in about five years. Um, it cut the price for all commodities in the U.S. And, and Gould ordered that the coal costs in Wyoming be cut by 70%. So, so the miners agreed to a two cent per bushel cut from the seven cents, but the UP actually cut it by five cents to two cents net. And when the miners struck, they were replaced by Chinese. They, uh, the Union Pacific hired uh, Chinese workers that had been used in construction and brought them in as miners. And uh, the Chinese were mainly in two mines, one in Rock Springs and one in Alma, which was near Evanston, a little bit farther west. And the railroad built housing uh, for them. Uh, in, in Carbon and Hanna, which are further east uh, 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 from Rock Springs, they were primarily European uh, miners. <clears throat> uh, there are two pictures there of some of the riots that went on. The, this was a period of massive uh, labor unrest because wages were being cut everywhere and much of it was concerned with railroads. There were massive strikes in Pennsylvania, 
with the railroads and, and uh, strikes as well in, in the coal mines in Pennsylvania. Uh, <clears throat> as time went on, the political environment changed a little bit. For, for one thing, <clears throat> there was a, a very strong uh, anti-Chinese movement in, in the US. And in, in 1882, uh, the Congress passed the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which basically forbade uh, Chinese laborers from entering the United States. <clears throat> And you, you get a sense of how bad that is. This ad here is, is a, an ad for a washing machine from Dixon, Illinois. Now, there were no Chinese in Dixon, Illinois in, in uh, 1882. But <clears throat> the, the fervor of this you know, racist movement was such that uh, th this washing machine company was using this, you know, very populist concept at the time as a method of selling its washing machines. <clears throat> After the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, some unions started to move in, in particular the Knights of Labor, who by and large were, were not a, a radical union. They were actually quite conservative in terms of, uh, and they did organize some of the Colorado and Wyoming mines, and they were negotiating with the Union Pacific for a greater share of the labor for non-Chinese, but the Union Pacific continued to actively hire Chinese. Uh, so during the summer of 1885, the, the Knights of Labor threatened to strike. And then uh, on September the 2nd, a, a fight actually broke out underground between Welsh and Chinese miners over a preferred rock face that they both thought that they'd been assigned to. The, the manager of, of the mine was a Welshman by the name of James Evans. <clears throat> And uh, there was some miscommunication and uh, both Welsh and, and Chinese miners ended up at the same rock face or the same coal face. And uh, there was a, a, a very nasty fight ensued. Uh, when, when the fight ended, uh, <clears throat> the uh, mining was also shut down by, by Evans. And uh, an our mob gathered in downtown uh, Rock Springs uh, the sheriff then shut all the saloons, and the mob sent word to the Chinese in, in the Chinatown, which was a specific section of the north section of, of the town, to get out. Uh, much of the mob was probably not miners. Uh, there, there were notorious, there was a, a, a doctor of southern extraction and a, a local uh, store owner named uh, and Mrs. Osborne, who apparently were two of the leaders. But, but in any event, uh, when the Chinese did not leave Chinatown, the mob attacked, uh, started shooting, uh, setting houses ablaze, and uh, the Chinese had to flee into the surrounding scrub. And, and most eventually, uh, over the next few days, got to Evanston, primarily on the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, the Chinese agent was, was a local gentleman by the name, it was a butcher by the name of O'Donnell. He got booted out of town as well, as did uh, the supervisor Evans. They got kicked out. And the sheriff was unable to raise a posse or maintain order. Um, <clears throat> the, the UP or the Union Pacific blamed the Union and it blamed Molly Maguire's. Uh, which were, of course, the, uh, the riotous uh, Irish in, in, in Pennsylvania for the violence, which they claimed was planned. And they prevailed on the governor to call out the U.S. troops, and, and they arrived about a week later into Rock Springs uh, with a, on a UP train uh, with 500 Chinese uh, under guard. Um, the Union Pacific had built part of Chinatown earlier, but they completely rebuilt it now. Um, there were 16 local arrested, primarily union leadership, as well as some of the men that were involved in the fight. Uh, but a grand jury was not able to return any indictments uh, due to a lack of witnesses. Um, the Chinese government protested and, and visited to conduct an investigation. And, and uh, the U.S. actually paid an indemnity of $150,000 to the uh, uh, Chinese emperor. Uh, the union did strike 
this shortly afterwards, and all the leadership and many other people, they were all they were all fired. Um, th this is a letter that a gentleman by the name of John L. Lewis. Now, that was not the John L. Lewis who later led the United Mine Workers. He, he was born in Iowa. This, this guy actually lived in, in uh, Louisville in, in Colorado. Uh, but he was uh, more or less head of the, uh, or at least corresponding head of the uh, Knights of Labor in the Rocky Mountain region. And he had written a letter to the uh, uh, Union Pacific uh, complaining about the lack of uh, uh, employment for a lot of his workers <clears throat> and the fact that they were hiring Chinese and laying, laying, uh, the, the Knights of Labor uh, members off. Uh, this had been written, this, this was often used as a, a, an excuse uh, to say that the, uh, the riot that actually happened was planned, but the, the uh, the issue was that they were threatening a strike. The, the KOL actually did not like to strike, and it was a conservative group. But anyway, so a, a, a few more facts about the issue. Uh, th there were many, many more Chinese killed in mining accidents in Wyoming that died in Rock Springs. Uh, there were 35 alone killed in an explosion in Alma in 1881. Uh, the Molly Maguires, which is this violent uh, wing of, of, of some of the, the unions in Pennsylvania, was not involved at all. There, there never was a chapter of, of what we call the Ancient Order of Hibernians in Wyoming. And what Irish there were in Wyoming were primarily in carbon, and, and actually almost all were in uh, Union Pacific management. Um, after 1885, Almost all the miners hired were Finnish, Italian, and Eastern Europeans. There, there were no more British miners really hired after that. But as time went on, I mean, the troops remained there until 1898, uh, the Spanish-American War. <clears throat> the relations between the communities in Rock Springs improved sufficiently that actually Chinese New Year was celebrated with a parade uh, through town. And uh, then as the Chinese workers were aged uh, and no new Chinese were coming in, they would be replaced by younger Japanese also hired through contractors. And the Japanese were, were coming in primarily through Hawaii, which by then <clears throat> had become part of the United States in 18, I think it was 91, and, and would come in uh, by that uh, uh, route. But the mining accidents got much worse. The, the Western coal mines in Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah were, were notoriously dangerous uh, in this time frame. Uh, the, the fatality rates were extremely high from explosions. Uh, there were two particularly gruesome ones, one in Hannah in 1903, and in 1908, another one. Um, including, I mean, the, the, the second one, there were 40 men killed in the first explosion, and then 19, including a newly appointed state mine inspector, were killed when a second explosion occurred a few hours later. So uh, <clears throat> things started changing a little bit after uh, the 1890s. Uh, for one thing, uh, the Montana mines, which were primarily up near near uh, Great Falls and, and down a little bit further south near Red Lodge were unionized by, with help from the Butte Miners Union and initially joined the Western Federation of Miners. But the Western Federation dropped coal in about 1896 and the United Mine Workers and Organizers West. And, and by 1903, they had organized Montana, Washington, Western Canada, and Northern Wyoming. Uh, they had a lot of help, especially in Western Canada, because an awful lot of the miners, they were British, and they were already radicalized from uh, their experience in, in the UK. And then in May 1907, two gentlemen by the name of Thomas Gibson and Michael Purcell organized Rock Springs, uh, primarily by using uh, uh, people who could speak Finnish, uh, Slovak, Polish, uh, other languages 
And uh, after they, they organized Rock Springs, they got Hannah and Alma, which were the two other major mines, to join the walk-up. So the, the Union Pacific attempted to first to hire more Japanese and, and then offered a 10% pay raise and then finally agreed to bargain. But, but there was a little bit more in between. <clears throat> Earlier that year, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the president, had issued an executive order uh, under pressure from a lot of the uh, unions that <clears throat> U.S. employers were importing indentured uh, Asian workers through Hawaii and, and maybe even through Mexico and Canada. And, and he issued this executive order in March of that year, basically uh, forbidding uh, the entry into the United States of, of indentured workers of any kind. Um, the other thing that happened is that there were pretty good relationships between the Asian, especially the Japanese and the European workers in Rock Springs. And the Japanese themselves indicated a desire to join the union. But the United Mine Workers, like the Western Federation and almost all organized labor at the time, supported the Chinese Exclusion Act and, and were pushing for Asian exclusion. But Purcell and, and Gibson, who knew John Mitchell, who was the president of the United White Workers, uh, persuaded him to support a change. And, and the United Mine Workers Board approved uh, the Asians joining the union in June 1907. And uh, two months later, uh, they got a new contract. The Asians at the time were being paid about a buck 50 a day. The uh, Europeans were getting about 250 a day. Uh, the, the union contract raised the wage to about 310 a day, and it reduced the workday from eight, 10 hours to eight hours. And then there's, there's a very interesting article in the 1911 Immigration Commission report, which says that 280 Japanese and 70 very elderly Chinese proudly wore their union badges in and, and Rock Springs as, as part of the union. In 1912, uh, this, this was the Union Pacific Coal Company mining workforce. 17% uh, of it was American. Most came from uh, Austria, Hungary. Uh, an awful lot of them were, were Slovenians and, and uh, Carpathians. A lot of Italian Greeks, uh, still some British, very few Irish actually. Other Europeans, uh, 132 Japanese, 51 Chinese uh, still at that time. And then in the later years, uh, there, there was a wonderful story about a, a, a minor son, Lao Hung, who was uh, joined the uh, army uh, in uh, 1917, uh, wanted to fight in, in World War I. They wanted him to be a cook, he refused. So they, uh, they gave him a gun and let him fight. And, and he had part of his arm blown off and received a purple heart. Uh, another miner, uh, Lao Chi, became renowned locally as a wonderful harstock, which as you can imagine in, in Wyoming would have been a very big thing back then. And uh, his fame, he actually worked as, as a harstock exclusively before going back to Canton eventually. Uh, all, almost all the Chinese who came were single men. Uh, very few women came from China in that period. And even when the Chinese died, they, they would have uh, their bones uh, taken up after a while and, and shipped back to China because that was part of their religion and, and, and uh, ethos. Um, the, the Union Pacific had pretty good relationship with the uh, Union. They formed an old-timers club. Eventually, almost all the Chinese retired, and, and one of the company presidents decided that, you know, for the Chinese, they would pay their passage back to China because that's, that's where they wanted to go. And uh, the union and the company gave them a, a big banquet before they left. And that, this year is a, a picture of that banquet in, in Rock Springs uh, with the uh, United Mine Workers and Union Pacific Coal Company officials. Uh, these are some of the miners photographed in, in San Francisco, some of the old guys uh, leaving to go back to China. 
these are uh, a, a few more. And uh, this is one of the guys he, he uh, married after he went back to China and uh, adopted uh, his uh, wife's uh, son. And uh, that, that would be a fairly common thing in the Chinese culture at the time. He did, uh, did quite well. Uh, this is the memorial in Rock Springs to the actual uh, miners who died in the, in the mob action and the riot. Um, there's a little bit larger memorial to all the mining fatalities in, in Rock Springs and Sweetwater County. There's still mining going on in Sweetwater County. They're still adding people to that. Primarily today, it's uh, a soda ash mine. But there's over 500 names. On, on, uh, on, on that list. And then uh, Gibson and Purcell um, were, were two interesting guys. Both were, were actually state uh, UMWA presidents, um, Purcell in, in Montana and Gibson in Wyoming from about 2007 to 2013. Gibson was hired by the UP Coal Company as their first director of safety in, 20, in 1913. And, in later years, after he more or less retired, he organized Red Cross groups for the company. He was also elected a state rep and a senator and passed a lot of uh, pro-worker legislation. And Purcell was also hired by the Montana coal operators as their state director. And uh, he was a leading citizen of Billings in the 1920s and 1930s. So the, the that immigrant era, all ended obviously in the 1920s and 30s uh, because of the First World War, because of US immigration laws, because of the depression. And, and then finally, in 1943, during the Second World War, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which had been pushed by Western mining interests, um, was finally repealed. So these, these are, are some of my references. Uh, um, there's a lot of reading in there if you really want to get into it. <clears throat> uh, but um, that's the story, uh, the rest of the story in Rock Springs. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Just need to unshare your screen there at the top. Okay, uh, questions? Comments? I, I have a question. Um, on the safety side, I assume these are bituminous coal mines. Were they like uh, horizontal beds, coal seams, and gassy with the you know typical that, or was there something different? No, they they were they were pretty they were bituminous uh, coal. Um, the 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 coal in the southern part of the state is bituminous. The the uh, and northern part of the state, Charlotte, it's, it's what do they call it, pre-bituminous or sub-bituminous? I'm not quite sure what the right word is, uh, but it's lower, lower higher moisture, lower, lower fuel value. <clears throat> but uh, uh, yeah, very gassy. They they had major major gas problems. Uh, in fact, I mean, they, they when when uh, the UP uh, got out of the coal business in in the uh, Oh, like 1945 or thereabouts. They actually sold that, that business to uh, of the, the properties to an Andarco Petroleum, wow. who Newman. primarily produced gas China. off the properties today. China and Keith Russ from England. Any other questions? Boy, we're quiet tonight. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. When, when some of these people were killed in an accident, what type of compensation did their families get? Um, okay, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure when the workman's comp uh, system came in in Wyoming. I believe it was about 1911, but I, I, I couldn't swear to that. 
but uh, <clears throat> prior, prior to that, if, if the person was single, uh, they typically got like $70 or thereabout, which was a funeral expense. And that was it. Um, if, if they had a family, uh, it was generally the case that they would get some uh, living expenses for maybe a year. Uh, so like if, if, if the miner was earning, let's say, I don't know, $700 a year, they might expect to get maybe half of that as a living expense for the year, but that would be it. Uh, when the workman's comp system came in, there was a standard payment for um, death. Um, although again, in, in most states, as I know in Montana specifically, uh, like the, the speculator accident in uh, 1917, um, the miners with families got about $3,500. Uh, the miners who were single and had nobody, they got the, the, the funeral benefit, 75 bucks. That was it. Most, most of the uh, European miners had, uh, before uh, Workman's Cop, had uh, insurance systems. The, uh, the, the, the British, the Irish, um, the uh, uh, Carpathians, uh, Slovenians, they all had their own benevolent uh, societies that they paid insurance like a buck a month into that would uh, pay benefits, uh, generally speaking. Out of curiosity, what was the employment uh, chain, so to speak, that brought miners to Rock Springs? I mean, were there people, besides the Union Pacific wanting the coal and some coal mines being formed, how did they get their workers? Um, well, the, the initial group, were, were uh, well, <clears throat> there was active recruitment of uh, British miners, uh, Welsh, uh, Cumberland, uh, Lancashire miners, uh, starting a few years before the Civil War, but, but going on till about, I'd say, 1871 or so. And they were bringing in maybe, I, I, I don't remember exactly, but in the best years, maybe 10, 12,000 uh, qualified workers. Those guys were brought into Pennsylvania, but by then, even though they were, they would pay their, their way in, uh, the US law was such that <clears throat> if, if the worker wanted to leave whoever brought him in after six months, he was perfectly free to do so. And most of them who had better opportunities elsewhere did. And uh, so the, the initial chain was literally uh, miners coming into primarily Pennsylvania and then going wherever they wanted. That, that was the initial chain. Later, uh, there was a more active uh, uh, solicitation of, of incoming Finnish and, and uh, Slovenian and, and uh, Southern European immigrants. They would actually recruit them right off the boats in Ellis Island or in New York or wherever. And, and, can you tell us about the can you tell us about the relationship between the mines you're talking about and the large uh, strip mine at Fort Bridger? Uh, the, the, I, I, the, probably the answer is no. I'm, I, I'm, I wouldn't be. Uh, I, 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 I wouldn't be really qualified to do that. I, uh, I'm familiar with the uh, um, modern strip mines up in. Uh, what is it the, is the Powder, Powder River, River Basin. Basin? Powder River Basin. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with those because I, I work with Rio Tinto when uh, they had had all those mines up there. Um, the, 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 there were mines in Northern Wyoming at the time, but they were just North of Sheridan and in, in an area, uh, relatively close to what would be today, I, I, I 25, 
uh, I believe the coal that's east of there in, in the Powder River is um, lower fuel value, higher moisture, lower in sulfur. But it, that, that kind of coal would, I, I don't believe, would have been useful at all back then. Uh, the, the, the coal near Sheridan had, had a higher fuel value. I believe it was subbituminous. It couldn't be used for smelting, for instance. It wasn't that good, but it didn't have a high enough fuel value. But it was good enough to be used to power uh, most, uh, most trains and uh, household use and um, many of the common uses. Oh, I, was, I was just thinking about that Fort Bridger was the only strip mine that was down in the southern part of the state. And it, it was not that far from Rock Springs. That's why. I yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, yeah. I, I, Jack. I'm I'm not familiar with that at all. Yeah. I, 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 I I thought it was. I thought you were referring to something up near uh, near the Powder River, but I. I oh, I, I'm not. yeah. I understand. I understand that area somewhat. It's quite interesting. I remember years ago being told that uh, Texaco had a number of properties near Sheridan that I don't know that they've ever been developed because I was hearing that they had coal seams that were 250 feet thick. So that they're actually gonna to have to bench mine the uh, seams. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I can't comment on that. I, you know, I mean, even, even to the point they have two or three drag lines in parts in warehouses up there. So they, they had a grand plan at one point that never materialized. Yeah. So, I mean, so another I, question on yeah. a question on the uh, Rock Springs mines, which coal, which makes good sense because uh, as a locomotive fuel, basically. Um, so I, I know in California, Early oil development was uh, spurred greatly by the Southern Pacific, which, of course, you know, the uh, ancestor, you know, uh, follow on to the Central Pacific uh, because they, the, there was no basic coal in the Western United States, uh, you know, uh, California. So that they were very interested when petroleum came around. So I would presume, and I don't know this, did that have an impact on, this, on the Rock Springs mines? The development the initial, of petroleum for use as locomotive fuel. When the when the route for the Transcontinental Railroad was lay, initially laid out, if you look at a map, if you go just west of Laramie, the route turns north up up to Hannah, and then goes on west. And the reason they did that was specifically because they needed uh, to get coal. They, the Union Pacific, unlike many of the other early railroads, but one of the early ones to use coal as fuel, whereas many of the other early railroads uh, used wood for a number of years. And then you're quite right about the uh, Southern Pacific. They were one of the early, in fact, probably the earliest uh, oil burner locomotives. We're on their system. Of course, you know, it comes to mind just as, I, as soon as I said that, as I said, the demand for coal, electricity came in here, there in the late 1800s. And that must have been a, a, a tremendous boost in consumption. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the uh, power stations and, and well, the, the electricity and, and smelting uh, obviously were. Uh, smelting of, of iron, smelting of copper <clears throat> in the Western United States. I mean, Marcus Daly had investments in, in Western Wyoming um, because the, the, the quality, the, the fuel value of the coal was, was much higher in Wyoming than it was in Montana. And uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they were down in that area. He, he had mines in Diamondville, which is north of, uh, north of Evanston. <clears throat> So was it was that in competition with Southern Colorado, Pueblo? Uh, Ludlow was a bit later, really, uh, uh, but but 
probably not. Um, I mean, the the the, uh, <clears throat> the 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 coal in 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 southern Colorado. I mean, there were there were plenty of smelters and uh, markets for coal just within Colorado itself, and and indeed down. I mean, New Mexico had, had pretty good coal as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Any we scare them off. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you, Eamon. Uh, that was really very interesting. I know I, I knew whisperings about Rock Creek, Rock Springs, and uh, it was really interesting to know about the Japanese coming in. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. And if you haven't renewed your membership, Please visit the website and get that done. I'm going to have to start sending out uh, postcards reminders soon. And so the fewer postcards, the less money the association has to spend on postage. Okay. Any last words from anybody or anything? I just wanted to say thank you. I enjoyed it too. Thank you very much. Very good. Good to see everybody. Yep. Thanks from Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.